Namaste. Welcome to the next episode of Yoga Vasishta. Today we're going to talk about the dangers of ego. Egoism springs from false conceit fostered by vanity. I am much afraid of this enemy, baneful egotism. All men in this diversified world, even the very poorest of them, fall into the dungeon of evils and misdeeds under the influence of ego. All accidents, anxieties, troubles, and wicked exertions proceed from ego and self-confidence. Hence, I deem ego to be like a disease. This world resembles a long, continuous night in which our ego, like a hunter, spreads the snare of affections. It overcasts the equanimity of mind, like an eclipse shadows the moon. It destroys our virtues, like frost destroys lotus flowers. It dispels the peace of men as autumn drives away the clouds. Therefore, I must get rid of this egotistic feeling. Now, it's very interesting that Rama here uses the very same word as the Buddha to describe ego. He calls it a conceit. And of course, what is a conceit? It's a flattering falsehood, a lie that we tell ourselves and others <laughs> to make us look good. So this conceit of ego is actually false. And the Buddha describes in detail in the Mula Pariyaya Sutta how that is so. That the ego is based on the thought of mine. We see an object out in the world and we identify it as mine. And then, of course, there has to be an I to possess it. So the ego existence is actually false. But it's proven by false logic, by addressing things, external objects, as mine. This is how the ego works. It's very sneaky. And the ego leads us to perform all kinds of terrible misdeeds, isn't it? How many things have we done that we regretted later, just on account of the ego, just to make us feel better about ourselves? Huh? And while various self-help books may praise this, actually we know it's a mistake. Because just like setting your watch 15 minutes ahead so that you're never late, <laughs> you know it's 15 minutes ahead. huh? So you're, you wind up being late anyway. Self-deception is not a good policy. <laughs> so let's face it, the ego is a construction. It's a fabrication. It's not real. It's something that we create and waste a lot of energy on. Because how many people have done stupid things like buy a car that, that they don't need? Uh, or buy clothes that they don't need and waste lots of money and time going to clubs, uh, getting some outrageously uh, expensive club membership or something like that, just for their ego, just for the sake of some designation. Oh, I'm a member of so-and-so club. And the list goes on. So many things are done in this world just out of ego and trying to pump up one's perceived dominance in the world. It's the dominator culture again. Don't be fooled by it because this ego is like a disease. It makes us stupid. It makes us do things that we don't need to do and especially makes us do bad things that we don't need to do. So the ego disturbs our equanimity of mind. It agitates us 
Say, I need a better ego. I need more ego. Uh, I need more prestige or more this or more that. And so we do all kinds of useless things. It's not good to listen to the ego. It destroys our peace of mind. And so Rama here comes to the correct conclusion that I must get rid of this egoistic feeling. Because that's all it is. It's a feeling. Huh? It's not real. I am not Rama the prince. I have no desire, nor should I wish for wealth. But I wish to have the peace of my mind and remain like the self-satisfied old sage, Jina. All that I have eaten, done, or offered in sacrifice under the influence of ego have gone for nothing. The absence of ego is the real good. So long, O Brahman, as there is ego, he is subject to sorrow at his difficulties. If he is devoid of it, he becomes happy. Hence, it is better to be without it. I am free from anxiety, O sage, ever since I have come to know the impermanence of all enjoyments, gave up my sense of egoism, and attained tranquility of my mind. So this is the real thing. Huh? Rama gets it right. That we shouldn't bother to follow the ego. We shouldn't try to fulfill its mad desires. Rather, we should try to restrict it as much as possible, and if possible at all, to eliminate it. And that will make us happy. Huh? Why is that? Because for one thing, we won't be comparing ourselves with others. We'll be like the sage Gina, who said, I'm not like anybody else. Why should I evaluate myself in terms of others? what others have, or what others know, or what others can do. Huh? I'm just going to be thinking less of myself, and that's going to disturb my mind. So Gina decided to become happy with just what he is. And in that way, he found peace of mind. It's an old story in the Vedas. So the absence of ego is actually good. Huh? People want to gain more ego or a bigger ego or a healthier ego. People spend thousands of dollars and years of wasted time in therapy just to heal their ego or enhance their ego in various ways. It's better to be rid of it entirely. And that is the purpose of meditation, to get rid of the false ego, the false mind. So once a person has an ego, you know, life is full of ups and downs. They happen automatically, just like the phases of the moon. So when one is in difficulty, it's a natural thing. It's going to happen. Huh? But if we have an ego, then we create additional difficulty. Huh? One thinks bad of oneself for being in difficulty, when actually the difficulties just come by the law of nature has nothing really to do with oneself. Unless, of course, one has done something stupid <laughs> to create difficulty for oneself. Then the uh, fretting over the, the perceived difficulty causes it to become even more difficult. Do we really need this ego? I don't think so. The self-conceited are decorated with a string of pearls about their necks, of which greed forms the thread, and repeated births are the pearls. Our hostile enemy, ego, like a magician, has spread about us the enchantments of our wives, friends, and children, whose spells it is hard to break. As soon as the impression of the word ego is effaced from the mind, all our anxieties and troubles are wiped out. I have given up my ego, yet my mind remains stupefied with sorrow from my ignorance. Tell me, O Brahman, what do you think is right for me under these circumstances? I have given up this egoism with much trouble, 
and I would like not to depend upon this source of all evil and worry anymore. So here Rama condemns the egotistical person by saying that the ego is like a necklace with a string of greed and pearls of future births. Because of greed based on the ego, basically we create our future births, our future lives by our greedy desires for more and more things just to enhance our ego. We don't really need those things, but we desire and pursue them anyway, just out to inflate our ego. It's better without it. We surround ourselves with all kinds of unnecessary possessions and entangling relationships that just bring us difficulty and sorrow because we're going to lose those relationships someday anyway. Why bother? Huh? Better to be alone like a sage in a mountain cave, aloof from society. Really, it's better that way. So he makes a great point here. As soon as the impression of ego is effaced from the mind, all our anxieties and troubles are wiped out. Because anxiety and trouble has to belong to someone. And if there's no ego, then whose anxiety, whose trouble? It's just something, a condition that exists in the world. It has nothing to do with me. It's only when we have this ego and compare it with other egos or with ourself in the past or as an imaginary future, huh? then all of a sudden these troubles become more troublesome. The difficulties become more difficult because now we have added ego into the equation. This is nonsense. So finally, he says, I have given up my ego, but my mind remains stupefied from my ignorance. How could I be so dumb? How could I be so stupid as to create a false ego? It's all nonsense. It's just a lie. So even though I have gotten rid of it, as far as I am concerned, I'm very, very worried that it might come back again somehow because this is a source of all evil and trouble, this ego. So how do we get rid of ego? Well, we have to see, first of all, that it's a construction, that it's a fabrication, that we create the ego, we imagine it into existence. So to get rid of this imaginary ego, we simply have to stop imagining it. And that is one of the purposes of deep meditation. We're going to be getting into all of these things in future installments of this series. This whole introduction, the first book, actually just sets the scene by raising the question of what is the source of human misery and how can it be eliminated? And in the later books, we'll get detailed instructions on how to do this. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Arunachala Shivam Yidam